Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, the topic I want to explore today is the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic ended up adding many, many layers of complexity to the workplace, especially as companies increasingly relied on technology to establish secure remote work capabilities. And from there, where they've gone on a whole journey from remote working to hybrid working and working from any device on any network and at any time. And as a result, many companies are now racing to adopt multi-cloud solutions. And since multi-cloud IT infrastructure can provide exceptional benefits, including optimising cost performance, avoiding vendor lock-in and increasing reliability by distributing assets in the event of an IT crisis, there's another side to this tale too, because companies that fail to employ security guardrails when planning a cloud migration are also severely increasing their risk of misconfigurations that can lead to a devastating security and compliance incident. So today, I want to explore how cyber asset management can help companies maintain a competitive edge by giving them the visibility and the governance of their IT environment. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to the UK where Keith Nielsen from Cloudsphere is going to sit down with me and explore these topics in a little more detail. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Keith. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Uh, so um, hi, everyone. Thanks for, for tuning in. Um, I'm the tech, uh, technical evangelist for Cloudsphere. Um, and my role comprises of many different functions uh, across the business. Typically speaking, I help with competitive analysis, uh, produce collateral, I help with sales enablement, uh, I help our product management team, um, but I'm also responsible for a lot of PR activity. I, I sort of lead uh, analyst relationships and the cloud provider relationships. So a lot of sort of strategic activities that um, we do at Cloudsphere, I, I'm typically involved in. Uh, but it also includes, you know, customer and partner use cases. Um, really, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is help Cloudsphere refine uh, market fit. And it's an incredibly cool job title, isn't it? Technical evangelist. I bet, I bet you'd love writing that one down on the passport for when you apply. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those that, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can get away with that because it's, it's one of these things where we say, sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, and a long time ago, I, I, I did actually get held up in Cuba with uh, the role I was doing at the time. Uh, and they didn't, get, they didn't understand that, which was interesting. So I, I tend to just write IT professional. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had a very similar experience at San Francisco Airport, um, uh, and they asked me what I did. I ended up getting taken into a separate room, and I had to try and explain what a ghostwriter was and what a podcaster was. And, and in the end, we settled on you make other people look good. And I thought, yeah, that, that'll do. <laughs> Let me go. Yeah, we'll take yeah. that. <laughs> But uh, before we talk about your role now and the success that you've enjoyed, I always like to ask my guests where their passion for tech came from, what lit the spark and and what was their origin story. So can you tell the listeners a little bit more about that moment that put you on this path? Um, Yeah, I'll give you a bit of a bit of a tale, as it were. Um, I guess I've always been interested in technology. Um, You know, I've always been interested in in gadgets and computing uh, from a young age. I think if being honest, uh, I'm sure probably not alone with this, but I think it was probably gaming and games that I think, you know, got me attached to that. And I think, you know, from that, I ended up sort of building out a computer myself uh, a long time ago now. I've done that several times, you know, when I was young. Uh, and I think it just really pulled me into what's possible with computing and technology as a whole. Uh, and so I think I think that was probably the the spark. And I am a bit of a gamer. I don't really get the time to do it anymore, unfortunately. Um, and the, the kids take up the console time if I do get it. But uh, yeah, that that's kind of like, I guess, where it started out, you know, with my interest in technology. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm very similar myself. I, I I still try and keep my hand in gaming, but it took me about six months to finish The Last of Us 2, where it takes most people like, a weekend, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a great game, by the way. Yeah, it did. It took me a long time as well. Uh, and obviously, when you've got little ones, you can't really play that kind of thing, yes. um, you know, at, at their sort of time when they're still up. So yeah, late nights and you don't get much of those. So yeah. I feel the pain. 
<laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, it was that path that led you to Cloudsphere, which is a cyber asset management platform that provides the insights required to help businesses optimize and secure hybrid and multi clouds. Big hot topics at the moment. But can you ex- expand on that and, and what sets you apart from other solutions out there? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I probably should just sort of add a bit more to that previous yeah. um, question just to b- give a bit of context to that. So, you know, that, that interest that I've had. Um, it paved the way for uh, a natural move into technology as a career. My my dad worked in technology, um, and and so that was kind of a natural a natural fit. Um, I started off my career um, as a component specialist, uh, moved into a reseller, uh, and started actually doing tech support. I've always sort of been quite technically natured. I love understanding how things actually really work, and what I love even more is actually. Um, helping to share that information and and grow that information understanding myself but obviously through others um and so i i ended up sort of moving into an architecture team i started to specialize in uh certain areas of technology like data center design um also ended up specializing in sort of enterprise mobility and cloud technologies right at the cusp of when it was emerging as we understand it today uh, and so i built my career um on being a sort of pre-sales lead, uh, you know, handling requirements, gathering, um, gathering those requirements, but also product positioning, you know, technically and commercially. And I've worked in a number of startups, typically gone in first on the ground, uh, actually building out pre-sales engineering teams and and helping out actually really with the full go-to-market stack. That's kind of what I specialize in. And so I, I do a bit of everything really, M- product marketing, pre-sales, you know, product management, analyst relationships, as we said before, um, competitive analysis, that kind of thing. And one of the greatest successes that I've had, uh, if we go back to sort of 2015, um, and this ties in with cloud spheres. I, I helped pivot a product uh, and I drove that into the market. And within three years, I've managed to get that technology embedded into about 13 GSIs. Um, and I was responsible for all of the customers, you know, all the technical efforts to get every customer and partner that we had. Um, and AWS ended up taking that IP and I designed and led all of those engagements, including the due deal processes with the, the engineering team. So that technology was about taking legacy workloads and being able to run them on, on a more modern operating system without any change to code. So very, very compelling. Um, and just like in that example, um, you know, coming back to what I've said before, what I typically do is advocate for improvements across the business. So I'm that conduit in, I represent the, pro- the, the customer in the market internally. Um, and I, I kind of call it productive pressure. Uh, that, that's kind of what I, what I do uh, as the conduit into the business on, on other departments. And, and, you know, to answer your question, how this came back to CloudSphere. Well, uh, that was obviously uh, the whole motion of that technology was around cloud migration and modernization. Um, and so, you know, with CloudSphere, um, you know, what that product does is it supports that journey that the enterprises are on right now. It, it supports them from the planning and the migration phases, which is, you know, often ongoing as we speak right now. Um, it helps formalize a plan. It discovers assets that reside on premise, but also in the cloud, which is which is really helpful. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, and it gives a very comprehensive breakdown of candidates and cloud readiness. And that, I think that's a really important thing as, as organizations plan, um, not just you know day one migrations, but more mature levels of migration, which would perhaps incorporate modernization. Um, where it differs is... It provides dependency maps that are really comprehensive. It's one area that that it's different on because it's operating uh, at a business service level. So it's automatically grouping organizations, business services, and underlying apps together. A lot of other technologies will stop at an application level. Uh, And and the the real pain with that is that it's then up to the customer to try and understand and mitigate risk. Because as you know, business services incorporate many applications and those business services end up having interdependencies themselves. You, you cannot just you know, go on a whim and move something because the implication might be that it, it, it doesn't work and the risk is too high. So CloudSphere is all about reducing that risk. But the other point is that we support day two. So once an organization has assets in the cloud, they've migrated some technologies already or they've spun up some new, um, 
our technology helps um, mitigate risk further by providing that governance, leveraging the, the discovery technology that we have, but it provides the governance and the security rules uh, around all of those assets in the cloud. And the key thing is it's the context that we provide. And that really helps organizations visually respond to misconfigurations or governance issues and prioritize which ones are actually going to be more impactful. And that's the real key thing. So it's day one operations and day two that CloudSphere kind of specializes in. And of course, now many companies all over the world and people listening to this are all racing to adopt multi-cloud solutions, especially as we're all entering this hybrid working environment now. So I'm curious, what are the, the key drivers of this trend that you're seeing? And, and ultimately, what are the key benefits for businesses that, that they're going after too? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting conversation, multi-cloud, uh, and it can get a bit heated. <laughs> um, so I think the point is multi-cloud comes in different guises. You know, you, you've got some people that I know, as I've said, don't really like the term. Um, you've got advocates for doubling down on one cloud provider, but you've also got a huge group of people that will say having dual or multi-cloud um, provider strategies will keep you competitive in a, uh, put you in a, you know, a stronger commercial position. Um, you know, some will say that um, any benefits that you have around discounts will be blocked if you look at multi-cloud, um, such as discounts, but others will be in the pocket that says, actually, you're in a stronger position to negotiate. So it's pretty mixed, but whichever way you look at it, um, I think there's been an abundance of you know, SaaS solutions, software as a service solutions, which is ultimately, of course, hosted and run predominantly by major cloud providers, not always, but mostly. And so when enterprises consider and assess the, the sort of back-end performance, support, suitability of SaaS solutions, you're ultimately inheriting the cloud provider that supports it. So what's really interesting is when organizations think that they they have a single cloud strategy and not a multi-cloud, you start venturing into uh, exploring their SaaS solutions and all of a sudden they ultimately do have multi-cloud <laughs> without <laughs> necessarily knowing it. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting conversation, but I think there are benefits. Uh, I, I think benefits would be you know having greater flexibility and scalability. If you scale beyond the boundaries of just one cloud, you've, you've naturally got more um, you know, capabilities at hand than a single cloud provider. And I think cloud providers ultimately do things slightly differently from one another. There are some technologies that have been innovated and certain providers have more mature or better capabilities in those technologies. So, you know, that might suit uh, a particular service or application better than another. And I think the last thing I mentioned is around risk management. Um, you know, cloud has such a high level of availability and resilience, but outages do happen and, you know, not too long ago, we actually saw some outages. So I think having all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, is that sensible? It, it, it might be. But I think what it comes down to is, you know, the key point being is to assess each application, each service, is each business function that you have that you want to be supported by the cloud, and then consider where the best place for that asset is to, the, is to reside. And I don't have the answers for that, right? It's that analysis that organizations need to do. And naturally, I think that will help them in their decision-making process for, for multi-cloud. And security is also a big topic right now. So I've got to ask, can you tell me a bit more about how companies that do fail to employ security guardrails when planning a cloud migration or severely increasing their risk of misconfigurations? And we all know what that can do, especially leading to devastating security and compliance incidents, et cetera. But that's just a boring XIT guy in me coming out. But, but can you expand <laughs> on that too? Yeah, I, I think, um, and I, I didn't want to focus on it too much because I'm sure we're all yeah. sick to death of it. But I think the the pandemic um, may have had some impact on the volume of misconfiguration and governance issues. I think, you know, but on the whole, it's important not to look at uh, something like cloud migration as an example as as just a technical exercise and project. I think it is actually a much bigger than that. It's it's a transformation. It's a cultural change across the business, and to support that, I think there's actually at least two other transformations that have to take place for it to function and successfully minimize things like misconfigurations and, and security issues. And that's because there is infrastructure transformation, which is norm normally perceived as the sort of migration element, um, but there's also supporting it, right, through operational and delivery transformation, things like DevOps uh, approaches um, that ties into security misconfiguration. There's also the architectural side of transformation. So, 
the, you know, the way we architect our applications over time and the services that we evolve um, within the cloud to, to take advantage of uh, those architectures. So there's a lot of going on. And, and I think responsibility of things like security has shifted around a little bit um, during the course of, of those transformations. And so it's about, you know, robust planning, planning in, in terms of what you need to migrate, but also what controls are applicable for, you know, when we're migrating, looking at the data, looking at the compute, the operating system, if you're still going to involve one, the network, et cetera. I think the whole stack needs evaluating uh, ahead of time. And those guardrails need to be designed and implemented to support that, that migration. Um, I think the other challenge, though, is, is tracking and measuring these over time. And this is coming back to that day two piece. I, I wouldn't just assume that, you know, assets are falling out of compliance um, or uh, to those policies and, and, and those policies, um, you know, being the issues. I think what you need to do is evaluate the policies continuously. It's not just the assets that necessarily fall out of that compliance. It could also be that the policies age, you know, cloud is moving so fast. And I think whilst that's a great benefit, you also need to ensure you've got the right instruments and tools in place to ensure that you're on top of something like misconfiguration. And that can happen at the policy level too, not just the asset level. So, you know, they do happen. Um, they can be really impactful if you're not careful. Um, and I think organizations just need to ensure that they've got the right cloud-centric instruments to make sure that they don't fall foul of, of those governance and compliance issues. And I also think just a few years ago, boardrooms didn't seem to get the ROI of cybersecurity and cyber asset management. I think for the most part, that has changed now. But for anyone listening that might still be sat on the fence, can you expand on how cyber asset management can actually help companies maintain a competitive edge out there? Yeah, um, I think... I think risk uh, is a key word, uh, yeah. ultimately, and I think it holds back innovation sometimes uh, from from the work I've done previously. You know, as part of those sort of migration and, and modernization projects, it it definitely does. It's a it's striking that balance between being able to adopt a new technology in a secure and safe way, or as best we can make it that's acceptable in terms of risk and impact. And I think you know having the ability to ensure security and governance of all of your assets in the cloud including those that uh, an enterprise might be exploring for, for the future, provides the platform to try and keep up with that, the, the pace of innovation that all enterprises need to do to remain competitive. And that's the that's the game, really. Um, so if you look at something like, um, you know, edge computing as an example uh, and a use case, there's some really cool use cases coming out, um, but naturally introduces, you know, some fresh challenges again. Uh, some of them are actually older challenges that are kind of being, you know, um, brought back to life, so to speak, in terms of, you know, physical access, things like that. So having the ability to adopt new technologies, but with the controls that you need is, is ultimately the, the enabler for, uh, you know, com com competitive edge. And what is it excites you about the future? Are there any other tech trends that you're seeing and, and watching closely that, that particularly interest you? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I... I love transformations. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's that's what I, I really enjoy being part of personally. And the, the startups that I've worked for previously uh, have, have typically always been around some form of transformation. That's that's something that I'm very, very passionate about. I think, you know, there's something exciting about new technology, new processes, new innovation. That for me is what I love about technology. Um, so I think we're seeing uh, an evolution right now in the way that enterprises are looking at migrations too and it's starting to incorporate modernization of of applications of processes and this is one area that i personally love uh to to be a part of and i, I watch very closely um you know, like i said it's it's obviously in an area that i've had success in before and it was a really exciting time for me um and i think a lot of the drivers and the problems around that are just so compelling um that that it's just something that i'm quite keen on uh, you know being a part of and, and keeping an eye on Love that. And we started the podcast today talking about your origin story, how you've got where you are. And as we come full circle, this is the bit where things get interesting now. I'm going to ask if there was a song, <laughs> movie, book, or anything that has inspired your career. And if you've got a story behind that, if you could share it, and we'll leave the listeners on an inspirational note today. Right. That's a very hard question, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I've just been true to myself here. So that's a hard one to answer, but I think what's helped me in my career, you know, I'd have to say music in terms of what's helped me. I mean, I, I love movies, obviously, but I'm not sure I've had lots of inspiration from those. I just sit and watch. But I think whenever I've had lots of stuff to do, you know, work, pr things to sort of produce and draw up and get stuck into like presentations or tender responses and that, that kind of thing, I normally 
play music and uh, it, it's normally kind of like metal music. <laughs> uh, I, I, I sort of listen to lots of different types of music, but that's the the one that kind of gets me in the zone, so to speak. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go with that. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, it, you know, my favorite band's uh, a band called Trivium. I'm not yes. sure if anyone's really heard of them, but um, they're, they're pretty big if you like that kind of music. And that's what I'd go with. I think they're an incredibly talented band. So yeah, the, I guess the song I'd pick would be uh, No Way Back Just Through. That's the song I go with. Love it. And it's not the most bizarre choice we've had on here. I had a guy uh, request pirate metal a few weeks ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. There you go then. Yeah. I'm a bit no. more comfortable about that. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but, but for anyone listening wanting to find out more information about CloudSphere, anything we've covered today, or even reach out and contact you or your team, what's the best way of doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Uh, obviously, our website is is first and foremost. We do have a, a, a big presence on LinkedIn um, and, and Twitter. Uh, I myself uh, feature, I, I post quite a lot on LinkedIn and, and Twitter too. So absolutely feel free to reach out to myself um, or to the, the wider team. Our contact details as a whole uh, can obviously be found on our on our website. Um, so yeah, please reach out if, if you feel that you've got some interesting questions for us to answer. If you've got some use case you think we, you know, we might be able to help in, we'd love to help. Well, over the last two years, I think it's added so many different layers of complexity to the workplace, especially as companies are increasingly relying on technology to establish secure remote work capabilities. But I love how you've broke that down today, simplified a lot of it as well, and also showed the ROI and how you can get a competitive edge from, from this technology. But more than anything, just thank you for sharing your story and leaving us with a Trivium track too. So thank you for joining <laughs> me today, Keith. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Appreciate it. Speak to you soon. Thanks. I must admit, I consider myself very fortunate to do what I do, to sit here and record a daily podcast and write for not only myself, but for other people, ghostwriting tech articles for CEOs, etc. But let's be honest, technical evangelist, that is a job title and a half. I'd love that. I think if I ever made it to be a technical evangelist for a company, I think I might even buy myself a white suit. I'm not sure I could pull it off, but... More on that story later. Seriously, though, thank you so much to Keith for taking the time to come on here and share his insights and discuss some of the the major talking points, contentious issues, and some of the problems that every business leader is going through and talking about right now. And hopefully you found it as valuable as I did. But I'd love to hear more about what you're going through at the moment, what your big talking points, what big trends excite you, whatever it might be. Email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram at Neil C. Hughes. If you do leave a rating and review, please send me a screenshot and I'll give you a shout out in the next episode. But that's it for today's episode. So thank you as always for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.